welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another Match Fit Football Podcast. I'm Darren Potts, your host, as always, here on the Match Fit Podcast. This is a new season, a new series, and today I am joined by Dion Curtis Henry. He's a goalkeeper for at Crawley Town. We're going to get to him in a little second. But for all your Match Fit needs, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube at Match Fit Football. But Dion, welcome to the podcast. Delighted to have you here. How's your day going so far? Uh, yeah, no, nah, thanks for having me on here as well. It's been uh, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, today's just been sort of chilled from obviously last night's game. So sort of just been chilling at home and doing little bits and bobs and sort of resting ready for training tomorrow. So, Yeah, day off after an EFL game last night. You had a night, cup game last night. Um, what's your thoughts sort of on your season so far, just before we kind of get going into the person behind the athlete, as I like to call that section. But how's your season been this year? Well, how are you finding things at Crawley? Uh, obviously, I've only just joined since um, since Thursday, so it's obviously been quite new. But obviously, yeah. for me, the last obviously this season has been pretty much nothing's happened from obviously because of since COVID and stuff like that as well. It's been hard to get back into football, but obviously got the opportunity at Crawley last week, and um, yeah, joined in. Good bunch of lads, good coaching staff. So um, so yeah, started the best way I can do so far. Brilliant. Well, glad to hear that you've joined Crawley. You're enjoying it so far. Your first first appearance last night, I believe. Um, yeah. Let's talk about a little bit before we get to Crawley. Take me back. Let's go back to the beginning. When did you know or when did you decide or how did it happen that you wanted to be a professional footballer? Um, I think it's quite cliche. I think every kid dreams of it at some point. Uh, for me, probably wasn't the case uh, compared to a lot of my mates. I think I started off sort of doing uh, a lot of martial arts, actually doing judo when I was younger. Um, really enjoyed doing that. And it weren't until about the age of sort of 12, 13, 14, where I actually got more involved into football um, and sort of getting into professional football was actually more of a bit of luck, really, rather than actually determined to go for it. Um, I ended up playing sort of local football around Ipswich, where I'm from, and then got an opportunity to trial at Ipswich just for some training. Um, didn't really take it too seriously. as Like I said, I weren't too involved at it at the time or too fussed about doing it as a profession, but um, found out some sort of harsh realities of football early on. And I think that made me sort of in my head thinking I can I can prove people wrong and sort of go for it. And then after that, I went to like a, a goalkeeping camp for um, six weeks in Oundle with a company called Just for Keepers. And there's about three, four hundred goalkeepers there, all from around Europe, age from five to 21. I think I was 14 at the time. And after the week's training there, I managed to get pulled at the end of my parents. And um, one of the coaches there was actually the goalie coach at Peterborough United at the time. And straight off there, and then he offered me a contract straight off. So after that, it was a bit like, wow. And it was sort of just looked at mum and dad. They both just said, do it. So I sort of, yeah, just went from there, really. Uh, it, it's incredi uh, That's incredible. Yeah. You know, you go to your first camp, you're offered the contract. There's obviously a lot of natural ability there. And you mentioned you were involved in judo as a kid and, yeah. and things like that. That must have been very good for your flexibility, which, of course, now is obviously one of the most important traits for a goalkeeper. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm quite big in general. Obviously, I'm like I'm six foot four, and I'm quite yeah. broad as that. So, being trying to be flexible is probably something I shouldn't be, but I try try my best to do it as size I am at the moment. So, yeah, obviously, doing judo did help, and then um, so yeah, that's that has put me in good stead going forward with goalkeeping work. So, so what happened at this camp then? You were doing various drills, different game like scenarios. Is that how it, it was, sort of it went? Just, like I said, it was all sort of like 300 goalkeepers from across Europe and there were so many coaches there and every day you were sort of just, for, I think it was for five or six days, wake up in the morning, have breakfast, train, have lunch, train again in the afternoon. And it was basically that. It was double sessions every day for five, six days, working with different coaches, working on different attributes each day, each session sort of thing, bit of fun and games involved as well. And it was just a good chance of scouts to come in every day and have a look at all the keepers as well, and I think out of the three hundred that was there, I think only, I think only me and some other, and some Slovakian guy who was about nineteen at the time. I think he got offered a deal at Scunthorpe. I think it was at the time. It was only me and him that actually got picked. And obviously, I went there just with the intentions of enjoying myself. It was actually a birthday present from my mum at the time because it was near my birthday, and I was saying that walking away with a contract. So it was the best <laughs> present I've ever got, to be honest. <laughs> That's amazing, um, and it brings me on nicely to the next question because the next question I want to touch on is your support system. Um, obviously being a professional footballer and having friends and family that look out for you and you're able to talk to and things like that. Whenever you were so young, your parents and your mum got you that 
you know, that gift to go to the goalkeeping camp and you told me whatever you were going to sign that they said, to you, yeah, do it, sign the contract, yeah. Let, let's go for it. What's that support system like for you, having your parents and people behind you encouraging you to go and maybe chase this and go for this? Because it is a hard path. Yeah, I think um, I think the support is the main the main sort of push, really. I think, like I said, every kid dreams of it and every sort of parent sort of says, oh, yeah, go on, go for it sort of thing. But when the opportunity came, obviously, even though financially at the time, family didn't really have a lot of money, so it was quite tough. It was my mum sort of, when she could, she on her days off, she was the one driving me around the country, taking me to games. And then if she couldn't because of work, she'd let my dad borrow a car and then my dad would have to take me as well. So we've done a lot of mileage and stuff during the weeks and things like that as well. But obviously it was the opportunity they saw. And um, they obviously said it's one that you sort of can't turn down. And even just into school as well, sat down with my school at the time when I got offered the scholarship. And they, luckily there was another footballer, a mate of mine who was at the, who was at the school as well. And um, they just said, look, we wouldn't want to stand in the opportunity. And luckily for me, obviously I, I was someone who did do my schoolwork anyway. So they weren't too worried and actually agreed to let me have a Wednesday off school so I could travel up to Peterborough to train for the day. And then I just made sure that I think it was two hours a week. I just sat in a spare room sort of thing, just caught up on the, on the work I missed out on the Wednesday. So it worked out right, actually. Absolutely. It sounds like it all was going to plan for you at that young age. And obviously the parents and the support system that's behind you, even the school supporting you, you know, that must have been absolutely tremendous as well. Yeah, brilliant, yeah. Let's go on to another topic. We're going to, we're going to talk, talk about the keys to success and the keys to elite performance. In your perspective, you know, you ended up at Crystal Palace for a while. Then you ended up playing at various different clubs. You're at Bella Ricci and now you're at Crawley. What are the keys to success for not just you, but for goalkeepers in general? What do you think are the most important attributes needed to succeed in the professional game? Um, I'd say a lot of them are sort of, they're all for the same position. I wouldn't really say those specific ones for a goalkeeper or for a defender or what I think. I've worked with a lot of players, especially a lot of old school players as well. And I think a lot of what they say is quite true. I think a lot of it, talent, talent obviously is a big factor. But at the end of the day, there's plenty of players out there who have made careers through just pure determination, hard work and everything like that as well. And I think that's what the main effort is. I think if you can put the effort in and you're determined enough to do the work and just do what people ask you to do, you'll make, you'll make yourself half successful sort of thing. I think then the talent will then kick on from there as well. Yeah, it is. It's a bit of like that mix between talent and hard work and obviously dedication to the craft, yeah. to the craft. And something you mentioned earlier on when you talked about you were doing judo and everything kind of came almost like an accident, but obviously there was natural yeah. talent there for you. What encouraged you to continue pursuing this? Because did you begin to fall in love with the game as you were progressing and training and being coached at an elite level? Um, or what made you decide, you know what, this is a contract, this is an opportunity. Now is the time where I'm going to make this a career for myself. I think um, start off, obviously, it was sort of, it was all new to me to start off with going from doing judo. And then all my mates, when they were doing football at that level, they'd obviously all started from four, five, six years old. A lot of players do. Obviously, I started 10 years later than that. So I started quite late. Um, so probably the next few years after that, it was still more just enjoying the opportunity I had still trying to work hard. And then obviously when I managed to get the move to Palace, it was like, okay, now it's even bigger. I'm now sort of training every day with Premier League players who I see on TV and, you know I mean, sitting in the changing room and stuff with them as well. So it was it was crazy as well. I said, but I think right now, this moment, the last sort of month, I'd probably say now is where I'm at full 100% realisation that this is the career I want to have. Obviously with the last two years being out of football, um, obviously because of lockdown, having to work on a building site the last year and a half, it's been really poor. It's just been not, it's not been nice at all, obviously, when I saw you're used to for the last sort of seven, eight years before that. So now I've got this opportunity at Crawley, even though it's a short-term deal, it's, it's sort of spurred me on even more to be like, I don't want to then go back on the building site again. And it's like, now it's like, I'll make sure I do what I can to hopefully get the deal extended, or at least if it does end, be able to kick on somewhere else. You're obviously dedicated or you would have ended up at Palace and things like that. So mm -hmm. whenever everything happened with lockdown and stuff, and I don't want to dwell on this topic too much, but did that give you the motivation to, I'm not letting this go. I'm not letting this slip. This is the path for me. This is the career that I want. Yeah, I definitely feel, I think the easy decision would have been 
just to stop there and then and just be like, right, it's, it's, it's obviously not worked out, it is what it is. But um, I've always said, all my mates have always said to me, oh, how was football? Are you going to get back into it? And I always sort of say, yeah, I'm going to. And I think a lot of the time, a lot of people probably thought, oh, he's just saying that because, do you know what I mean? He wants to get back into it. But I've always, during lockdown, I've always said to my parents as well, my friends, I will get back into it. It's just a case of getting that break. And obviously when you spend a year and a half, two years out of, for, uh, first team football and out of full time football, getting a team or a manager to give you that opportunity is obviously really tough. So obviously, like I said, with last week, it, luckily the fact that with the window being closed, clubs can't sign any players from other clubs on loan or on a permanent. They can only sign players that are non contracted. It's worked out for me that obviously I'm non contracted, so I was able to get my foot in the door and luckily um, sign a deal. And tell me a little bit about that move to Crawley. Um, when the phone rings, the excitement's probably ready there. You're excited, you're ready to go. What was that conversation like with John when you, when you first met him? Yeah, it was really crazy, actually. I was, um, I was actually due to fly out on the Saturday just gone. I was due to fly out to Sweden because I'd been speaking to an agent uh, with a team out there. And then on the Wednesday night, through a mutual friend of mine and the goalie coach at Crawley, I got a late phone call Wednesday asking what my football situation was because uh, Crawley looking for another keeper. And I've so explained I was due to fly out to Sweden on Saturday so I could maybe come back next week and come into Crawley if I didn't get off anything out in Sweden. And um, he said, actually, we'd, we need someone in right now. Can you come in tomorrow morning? So I was a bit like, OK, yeah, I can. So I called up my boss at work and said, look, sorry, but I've got an opportunity of football here to come in tomorrow. I need to take tomorrow off work. And he said, yeah, that's fine, no problem. Um, so, yeah, went up in the morning and trained, sat down with with the gaffer and the goalie coach. And he just said, look, do you know what I mean, you've done well. You know you through uh, mutual friends stuff. They just so, sort of said, look, we've got a deal on the table for you at the moment. It's just a short term one, but there's obviously opportunity there for it to be extended if 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 called upon. Um, so I think with the opportunity there right in front of me in black and white, it was a case of just after the year and a half I've had, it was about getting my foot back in the door, getting back in that environment with a good bunch, good coaches, getting back enjoying the football, enjoying the the hard work and stuff. And um, yeah, that's what I did. So. In a strange kind of way, the fact that it's a one month contract and a rolling contract, so to speak, does that give you that motivation to, to almost not so much prove the manager wrong? Because he's obviously backed you by giving you the contract, but to make it permanent, to you know, yeah. to go that bit further. Yeah, of course. Obviously, with it being a, a, a sort of rolling contract, um, it's one of them ones where it's enough motivation where I know that I've got the chance here to extend it, and, to, and I've got four weeks to try and impress and push on for even more. But then also the case is the fact that it puts me out there again, back in the map of football, where if there are other clubs looking, at least I know for the next month, I've got, do you know what I mean, the odd game here, guaranteed training, training every day with a good bunch of lads, I said good coaches, mm -hmm. and enjoy my football again. So at least then if it doesn't get extended, I'm, hope, I'm in the right place to then go forward elsewhere if needed. Yeah. 100%. You're in that position where you're you're training, you're fit, you're ready to go if if this doesn't work out the way you want it to. So either way, it's a good opportunity for you. And let's move on to a little bit about training. Describe to me, especially from yourself, because you, you mentioned you didn't come up through the, the academies or the system. You kind of started around 14. All your friends started 10 years before you and stuff. But whenever you started to get involved in football and obviously end up at Peterborough, then end up at Palace, it was a bit of a culture shock to you, the the professionalism of training and talk to me about a, the importance of a professional approach to training. Yeah, massively. I think when I first, obviously when I was first originally signed there, I was only sort of training once, twice a week. Um, it was more just on, just on a Wednesday and then sort of gone on a Saturday for games. And then my coach at the time said, if we can get you in every single day, we can really start to improve you technically and mentally and things like that as well. And it weren't until when I was there every single day training where you start to learn how important things are like your nutrition, your recovery and all that sort of stuff as well. Because it does have a real impact on the training as well. And obviously it makes training the next day easier if you look after yourself the day before as well. So I think when you're doing training every day, you sort of do, you do realise the, the concept of things you should and shouldn't be doing and how much benefit is as well. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little bit about Crystal Palace and what it was like for you and, and being there on a professional contract and maybe some of the the key lessons that you learnt during your time in Crystal Palace that's continued to take you on your footballing journey. 
obviously when I first had the interest, it was a big shock at the time to hear that obviously a Premier League club is interested in you as well. Um, obviously, I went there, got my, I still had two years left on my deal at Peterborough, but um, after a chat with, with Barry Fry, I was able to negotiate the termination of it. So I was able to leave on a free and just join Palace anyway. And obviously, when I signed there, it was straight away, basically training with the first team um, for like a good season, season and a half, every single day being around them every single day. And it was just like, a, like at first you're in, all, you're in awe of everything. Cause I said on, on TV, you're seeing play, uh, people like Wilfred Zaha, Wayne Hennessy, Speroni, all these other players on TV. And then to be training with them, sitting next to them at breakfast, shaking their hand and things like that on a daily basis. It's, uh, it's a real sort of shock, but obviously in, in a good way. And then obviously the level of training as well is obviously a level above what people are watching. I mean, the training grounds better. The, the pitch is better, the, the drills are better, the, the coaching is better. So obviously it was a real shock, but obviously in a good way, a, a lot of excitement there as well. And obviously when you get to work with some good coaches there as well, obviously when I first signed there, you had uh, Frank De Boer was there. So a lot of the football was sort of tick attack of football like that as well. And then you had uh, Marge, the goalie coach who's with England. He was the goalie coach at Palace at the time. So obviously I had, I, in my opinion, the best coach of the country at the time in front of me, giving me all these tips and helping me out. And I think he was a, a big reason what, what spurred me on in my time there as well. What's the expectations of you as a player at Crystal Palace? You know, you, you mentioned Premier League players, Frank De Boer, you know, legendary footballing career as well as obviously winning titles in Holland and stuff before coming to Palace. I know it didn't work out for him at Palace, but obviously his, his career and his, his personality and his character carries a lot of, you know, weight I suppose if I can use that word but you're training with Wilfred Zaha you're training with you know some quality players what's the expectation of you as a player coming into Crystal Palace? A lot of obviously with the, with the level of training and, and the players being higher you've obviously got to step up and it's one of them ones where they're not expecting you to obviously step up straight away they're not expecting you to come from a level you've come from to step up and suddenly you're you're you're, you're a natural with it but I think you've got to sort of realise in your head there's a switch here, right, right, I need to turn up again. I need to, all the things I was doing before, I need to do it 10 times better. I need to be doing 10, 10 times things more as well. And then when it comes to the training, it's just working harder than you've ever worked before and trusting your ability that with the work and the training, eventually it'll become more natural and you'll just sort of get the hang of it as you go as well. So like I said, the expectation's a lot higher, but that that is the Premier League. That's why it's the best league in the world because because of the level of the players and stuff as well. One of the things I've noticed, you know, when I watch, I watch a lot of different football from all over the world, but it's the pace of the Premier League is something I've noticed. And when you've taken that jump from Peterborough to Crystal Palace, did you notice a distinct difference in the pace of the game and the pace of training? Yeah, straight. I think it was probably my first, one of my first sessions training with the first team. We were doing shooting at the end of training and I must have had 50 odd shots against me and I reckon 50 of them went in. The pace of the ball, fly, <laughs> the pace of the ball flying past you, and just the pace of the movement, and just the drills, and it's just everything happened so quick. And at first, for a few days, it was sort of like, like bloody hell, this is really quick. But like I said, once you're training every day and you're getting used to it, you then start to speed up. You then start to get sharper, quicken up, and then next thing you know, them fifty shots that against you going in, half of them are going in, and sometimes less than that. Do you know what I mean? Because you're sort of you're getting your own pace up to scratch, and you're you're getting used to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it just sounds like an, an unbelievable experience for you. And, you know, I don't say that as if you were like there as a fan enjoying the experience. You were there learning, dedicated to your craft and wanting to improve as well. And um, what's the best piece of coaching advice you, you've ever received? Um, best piece of advice, I think, like I, said, I think it goes back to sort of the basic with, with when I was working with Marge at um, Palace. I think he was, like I said, probably one of the best coaches I've been under. And then Gary Phillips, the uh, academy goalie coach there as well, he helped me out quite a lot there as well. And I think it's one of the ones where I think a lot of young players, especially goalkeepers, especially at that level, they put a lot of pressure on themselves. And I think I was I was one like that as well to start off with. But both of them sort of just sort of told me like, look, if you weren't good enough, you wouldn't be here. And it's just a case of sort of just just relax. You're doing what you're doing because you're good at it and because you enjoy it. And obviously we see potential and it's just a case of just relax when you're doing it and just and just work hard and enjoy enjoy working hard but just know that you're here because you're good enough not because you're fighting for or anything like that. You're, you're good enough to be there it's just a case of sort of working hard and enjoying it 
it's an interesting point. You know, they're telling you you're good enough to be there and you just have to work hard and be dedicated to your craft and, and really believe and work. And it's something I wanted to touch on later on in the, in, in the conversation, but I'm going to touch on it now. Was there ever any issues with you and confidence? Did that make you feel, you know, like a million bucks? You know, they, these guys actually believe in me. Was there any point where you weren't confident uh, or did that help you step up that confidence and them telling you that they see the ability in you? Yeah, I think when I first went there, I was it was definitely more a bag of a bag of nerves. It was sort of like training and sort of trying to get used to it and thinking sometimes in your head you were thinking like, I'm wondering if this is too tough, if this is too much, or it's too hard for me, sort of thing. But then, like I said, when you're sort of having chats with Marge and chats with Gary and they're saying to you, like, look, if you weren't good enough, you wouldn't be here. And they're having like proper do you know what I mean deep, like deep conversations off off the training field, sitting down, having a chat. And obviously the fact that they're obviously both goalkeepers as well you could sort of relate to it as well I think it's just a case of that then sort of give you the confidence and then with Marge as well with his with his surface with his service volley and stuff like that as well I've never had balls hit so hard at me in my life before but it's the first few sort of volleys I ever took from him I was sort of just pushing them all away thinking Christ alive I'm not gonna be able to catch these <laughs> and then he's sort of saying to me like look just relax you're good enough to catch him just trust yourself and do it and then next thing you know He's flying balls at your face and, you, and you're just catching them like it's easy. Mm -hmm. And I think once you then got someone of his uh, his stature and Gary's who have got the experience telling you you're good enough and just to trust yourself and then you listen to them and it working, that's enough to then boost your confidence up. Think actually, I am I am good enough to be here. I am progressing. And that's just the sort of way you've got to look at it, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's it's a phenomenal learning experience for you. You know, you're training with Premier League players, some of the best coaching staff in the world. And we, let's move on a little bit because you've played at a lot of different clubs. And I want to know about yeah. the dif the differences between the clubs and the training and the matches. You know, Bellaricki, for example, Crawley, Crystal Palace, Peterborough. You know, you've had a, a lot of different experiences. What is different at the at these clubs? What was maybe the coaching side, maybe the match side? Maybe even, you know, you mentioned Frank De Boer and the Tiki Taka play at Crystal Palace. I doubt it was Tiki Taka play at every club you've been, been at. So No, of uh, course not. Like I said, I think I think a lot of it all comes in the same bracket of all the clubs where your your basics, your sort of do you know what I mean your hard work and your determination to help out for yourself and for the team. That's all just that was all basics. But obviously when you look at clubs like Obviously, I spent a lot of time on loan at Maidstone, at Hampton and Richmond. Obviously, I enjoyed my time there and the level obviously was still good. But then obviously when you then step up to to Peterborough, obviously the level obviously gets better because there's more there's more challenge involved and things like that as well. And there's more at risk. And then obviously when you then step up to Palace, it's even bigger jump. And like I said, the intensity is even bigger. The I mean the cost of your actions are even bigger as well. And there's a lot more there is a there obviously is a lot more pressure on you, but it's a case of you just just dealing with it in the best way you can and just sort of said knowing you're there for a reason and just doing what you're what you're there to do and that's just to, to work hard and train and just give it your best sort of thing it's a fascinating point that you've just made about the risk um, and obviously the higher level you're playing at crystal palace you know a slight mistake whether it be from yourself or even the fullback not tracking a run it can pretty much mm -hmm. end up at a goal you know whereas at some of these other clubs and i say it respectfully so sometimes you still have a chance after yeah. a mistake to stop that goal is that something that really stuck with you um from from your time training yeah definitely obviously with with the lower league teams as well obviously you haven't got as many people watching you either do you know what i mean you got maidstone you probably had anything between 300 and a thousand people at every game and you go to people like crystal palace and you've got anything from do you know i mean 15 to thirty thousand watching you so obviously if you're playing or even in reserve game if you're playing you've got at a a bigger club you are, you're gonna have more eyes on you and more people watching you, and that's just adds that more pressure onto you as well. Where mistake, whether it's from you or one of your teammates, it's a lot higher risk at the high level you're playing at. But it's just a case of everyone makes everyone makes mistakes in football. It's just a case of dealing with it in the right way and then just trying to make sure it doesn't happen again. But I don't think people mind it as much as long as they try and see you're trying to do the right thing, sort of thing as well. Yeah, I would agree with that one hundred percent. We're going to come on to another topic now, and it's called match fit performance. And I love talking about this 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 topic. So I want to know, in season right now at Crawley, give me a typical day in your life, a typical day in a goalkeeper's life, a training day. So train day, like for yeah, for example, for tomorrow. So obviously I'll turn up for training. We normally in for nine o'clock. I'll get there a bit earlier than that. 
um, get straight in the changing room, get changed in training kit, go into the canteen, get a coffee, have some breakfast there if, like I said, if you're feeling hungry. Um, and then for me, straight away, obviously, because it's a couple hour drive down the Crawley, I'll straight away get into the pre ab room, try and loosen up, go on the bike for 20 minutes, loosen up, get the foam roller out, stretch. If I need, obviously, any treatment, the physios are there to give you a rub down or help stretch you out, whatever you need, sort of thing. It's just a case of preparing yourself mentally and physically ready for training. Because obviously every training session you do, there's obviously a, a name and a reason behind it. So obviously with tomorrow's session, it will be working towards Rochdale away on Saturday. So it'll be a case of everyone just, like I said, mentally and physically preparing themselves ready for training to focus on training ready for the game Saturday. And then obviously we'll train. And then after training, there'll be obviously, then it just goes down to your recovery, make sure you recover properly from the session, make sure you, we have a meet and talk about the game, what, what our plans are, what our tactics are in the case of everyone just listening. So that way, if you are called upon, you know what the, what the score is, everyone's on the same page. And um, then, yeah, it's just there focusing on Saturday. It's an interesting point you made at the very, very start of that. You know, you said you'll go down a little bit early, you'll do a warm up on the bike, you'll get the foam roller right, you'll stretch. Was that something you learnt at Crystal Palace, at Peterborough, at another club, or is that a bit of you knowing your own body and knowing how you want to prepare for training? Where did that behaviour come from? Um, I'd probably say when I started off young, it was a case of sort of you sometimes, and some players the same. You could just you think you sometimes you can just wake up, walk in the train and train straight away, but it's not until you then catch yourself getting an injury where it's because you've not warmed up properly or whatever. I think I've seen a lot of players before where they've warmed up a little bit. They think they're ready to train. They've gone out, trained and they've pulled a hamstring. They've done something. That's all because they've not warmed up properly. And then I've done it before where I've, I've done training before where I've not probably warmed up as best I could. And before training, I can sort of feel a slight tight knot somewhere or something like that. But I thought, oh, it's all right. When I start, once I start training, it'll go away. And then sometimes if you don't sort of stretch it out or you don't get any treatment on it, you can end up making it worse. So I think a lot of it is a case of seeing other people do it, seeing other people not do it. And then it's yourself knowing your body is, everyone's body's different. Everyone feels different ways in the morning. Some people feel fine after training. Some people feel like they need to do recovery work on themselves more than others. I think it's just a case of knowing your own body. You know how your body feels. You know if something, if something feels tighter than something else. And it's just a case of you just being professional enough I guess to be like right I need to make sure this is feeling right before I go out and train to make sure I don't get myself injured so yeah and another interesting point that you made was your recovery and there's something I want to touch on as well whenever you do finish training or whatever you do know there's a knot or someone's tight or a little calf strain or whatever it may be what how do you recover quickly or how do you make sure that that injury doesn't progress are you a fan of massages or ice baths or heat therapy what what's your sort of go-to how do you maintain your fitness levels and not get yeah, hurt, I suppose? Every, everyone's everyone's different and has their own thing that works for them um like personally for me um obviously yeah i do find a massage does help so obviously if if the physios are free after training i'll make sure i get a massage in any area that feels tighter than others or um back at home here i've got a, a normal tech machine which is like a, you put your legs in them big black boots and turn it on it sort of like inflates and deflates so it like gives yourself a leg massage so i've got i've bought that machine when i was at, at palace to help which that's been a big help um i've got like the massage gun i've got, obviously got foam roller bands sort of like your little golf ball and stuff and anytime i've a train like if i'm feeling tight or even in the evenings as well it's just a sort of case of sitting down on the floor getting the normal tech machine out putting that on for 20 minutes half an hour to flush your legs out get the foam roller out and just having a general little stretch as well just because obviously your muscles are tight and they're going to be um tight after training and a bit sore so it's a case of just sort of giving yourself a bit of relief so the next day you're not going to feel as bad and that way you can just sort of kick on ready for training the next day so it's it's interesting because you've picked up some of these traits as you mentioned you bought you've bought things when you're at crystal palace you've got the band you've got the ball and you've everything in in at home as well to help with your recovery but these yeah. traits these traits these behaviors will stay with you the rest of your footballing career and even post football if you decide to take up another sport you'll probably still have these behaviors and the and take this attitude towards maintaining your body and and everything like that and i think that's so vital yeah i think obviously as you get older actually it's probably something you need to focus on a lot more because obviously the older you get, things like injuries just going to take you longer to recover from the older you get. So I think as you get older in football, you've actually got to look after yourself a lot more than you do when you're younger as well. 
So obviously when I get home as well, if once I've done what I need to do here as well, I'll um, pop to the gym. And obviously the gym I go to, they've got a pool and sauna and steam room and, and jacuzzi and all that as well. So for me, a lot of, I'm a big fan of um, pool therapy as well. For me, I, I think that works the best out of anything for me. So if I'm ever aching uh, in the evenings, I'll pop down to the, to the pool and get in the pool, have a little swim and then do a lot of stretches in the pool walk up and down the pool, little runs up and down the pool, make sure I do my stretch and stuff. And I find for me that that has a, a big uh, mental and physical um, benefit for me. So It's vital to know your own body. And obviously you're doing that and you're able to, to work on your recovery at home and obviously at the club as well, if you need a massage or anything like that. We're going to talk a little bit about food now because I want to know pre-match what your favorite meal is. And is there anything that you would eat or drink at halftime? maybe to replenish the energy levels, anything along those lines? Uh, yeah, obviously when you're with obviously certain levels, but obviously when you're at a level like Peterborough, Crawley or, or Palace, you sort of, you've got your pre-match mm -hmm. food, especially on away games, you've got your pre-match food sort of like there in front of you, for you. But obviously when you're at lower league teams, it's something you have to sort yourself. But everyone's different. I mean, I know, I know players that don't eat anything before a game. I know players that have as small a thing as possible, like even a bit of fruit and a coffee. And then um, obviously I know players that have breakfast and pre-match. Personally, for me, I sort of, especially like, for example, an away day in a hotel, I'll wake up in the morning, go down and I'll have breakfast. It'll just be a slice of toast with some sort of scrambled egg on. That'll be, and a coffee and that'll be it for me. And then it'll be obviously a few hours, that'll be pre-match. And a lot of it is, is obviously sort of your similar stuff. There's, there's toast there, there's your egg and beans. There's things like pasta, rice, uh, salmon, chicken, obviously your veg, there's fruit and yogurt. So I'll sort of just go down and have some pasta, some sauce on the pasta, some veg and some chicken. And then I'll be sort of a bit of fruit and yogurt. And that's sort of tend to what I normally stick to. And then obviously at uh, half time or before a game or sort of if I'm feeling a bit like I need a boost, I'll have a energy shot or an energy gel. And then again, same thing at half time. If I feel if I'm playing or if I'm not playing, if I'm feeling a bit tired or a little bit fatigued or just like I need to perk up a little bit again, I'll just make sure obviously I'll have a an energy gel or a, a tablet or something like that as well. But obviously I think the main thing is keep yourself hydrated throughout as well. That's a big thing that I think is underestimated as well. Tell me a little bit about learning the nutritional side of the game. Was that something that was taught to you at, at, at certain clubs, whether it be Peterborough or Palace or wherever? Um, were you taught about keeping your nutrition? Was there a nutritionist involved? Or as you mentioned, you know, even at Crawley and Peterborough and Palace, it's all kind of done for you. And it's just um, do you feel off it? Yeah, no, of course. Um, obviously, when I signed, when I was at Peterborough first, straight away, the younger you are, they think they try and get you into good habits. Because um, obviously, if you can eat the right stuff straight away and give yourself the best opportunity, then that's what you need to do. Obviously, of every footballer, I think majority of footballers out there are, are guilty of not always sticking to it. I hold my hands up to that as well. Um, but yeah, obviously, with certain days of training, it's all about. I think a lot of people know, obviously nutrition is always there to help people, but I think once you get to a certain age and I think you do your own sort of research, you, you know what foods you should and shouldn't eat. You know what foods to have at certain times and, and things like that as well. So um, a lot of it comes from sort of, like I said, yeah, nutritionists there as well, but also a lot of it comes just from self-learning sort of thing and looking into other things and research and stuff yourself as well. It's absolutely vital to succeed as a professional. I believe in football, having that, you know, basic knowledge as well of nutrition, as well as obviously yeah. the club providing, you know, it just goes hand in hand. And those little things that you do outside of your club, like going to the gym yourself and doing a couple of laps in the swimming pool or using the foam roller or eating correctly, how vital that is to your continued progression, you know, on, on the field and at club level. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I said, if I, I know for a fact where, like for uh, today, example, obviously we had the game yesterday and obviously I've got to train tomorrow. I know that I've done some of my recovery today, but I know that if I don't go to the pool later on tonight and have a little stretch, little swim in the pool and that as well, I know that I'll, I won't feel the benefit of that in the morning if I don't go because it's just something that I'm used to and I know that my body deals well with. So I'll make sure obviously after I've had dinner later on, I'll pop down there and have a little swim, have a little stretch. And I know that will getting ready for bed to have a good night's sleep and then make me feel a lot more fresh for the morning. So, What about any other supplements? Would you take anything else like your BCAAs or your whey protein or anything after a heavy session or your glutamine or anything along those lines to help aid in your recovery? Um, I do I do take some. I have um, some of my room. I take, obviously, protein 
because obviously quite big as well. Obviously, I need a lot more protein than, say, the average person does as well. So if I'm ever feeling like I need a little something, but I'm never too hungry or, or I'm, I'm not that hungry, but I know I need more protein, obviously, I'll have a protein shake before bed or after a gym session or after training. Um, I'll also just take me multivitamins because some days I like to eat veg, some days I don't. It's just how I feel at the time. But obviously, if I'm taking multivitamins, at least I'm sort of covered in that sense. Um, and then also recently, I've been taking a lot of um, omega-3 and cod liver oil because uh, I actually sat down with the nutritionist at, um, or one of the physios at Crawley, and he actually was telling me about I had quite tight calves and Achilles last week. And he was just saying um, the cod liver oil is omega-3. They're quite good anti-inflammatory. And um, apparently in green tea as well. So I've been making sure I have a lot more green tea and make sure I'm taking my cod liver oil as well, just to help with inflammation with the body. Cause obviously I didn't realize the big of effect it has on it as well. So. It's interesting the little nuances you pick up as you go through your career, you know, just something as simple as taking the cod liver oil and starting drinking green tea, perhaps instead of, you know, a yeah. tea, a tea or a coffee, which dehydrates you with the caffeine to an extent, you know, just yeah. those little small nuances that can subtly make a significant difference to your performance level. Um, what I want to touch on just before we go into the match fit mindset part of the podcast is the difference between youth football and senior football so when you were coming up through you know at 14 going to the camp and then getting signed for Peterborough and then making it into the full time and your match performance and your performance as a full time what was the significant differences from the youth to the the senior levels Uh, obviously a lot of it was the was the intensity of the anything from like the training sessions to the obviously the gym sessions and things like that as well. Obviously, once you're on that academy level as well, they sort of, it's all about building you up ready for when you get into that senior football. So a lot of, with youth players, when it comes to them doing gym work, a lot of young players, and I was guilty, guilty of it at a time as well, we're sort of sacking off the gym work. Because when you're younger, you sort of, oh, I don't need to be in the gym. I need to be out on the pitch and things like that as well. But you don't realise where the younger you are, if you get yourself in the gym and you start doing these proper gym sessions over time, they'll put you in a much better place going forward. So when you do hit men's football, physically you're, you've built up, physically you've got stronger. So then when it comes to dealing with training with men's football, you're a lot stronger, you're a lot more confident and it actually has a bigger effect on people than I think a lot of young people realise. And I think as well, you know, it's something we've talked about earlier in the podcast, it's that habit building. You know, if the younger you are and you start that habit, you know, you'll, you'll keep it all the way through your career. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think everyone wishes as well. If I, I wish I could go back in time and at that time when I was 14, 15, all the sort of information you know now, if I, I was to have that all in place then, start it back then, I'd probably be in much better shape or just feel better and probably be in a lot higher place than around at the moment where I've been the last couple of years. You never really know how how we're going to end up. But obviously, if you know thing as early as you can, it puts you in a lot better place to succeed higher up a lot quicker as well yeah absolutely and there's something we talked about slightly earlier you know we talked about the coaching staff at crystal palace you mentioned the gaffer and the coaching staff at crawley for you personally what type of attributes do you like your your coaches to have what do you think brings the best out in you i think personally for me i think a lot of uh, morale was the big is the big thing i think if you're able to get on with your coach off the field first I think that's a big a big plus going forward because I think you've got to have that mutual respect for each other and you've got to be able to get on with each other as well and I think if they obviously they're there to sort of basically tell you what to do and tell, this is how we're going to play and obviously their job is to tell you our job is to go on the pitch and, and do it and I think as long as there's a general and mutual respect and understanding of both trying to accomplish the same thing uh, I think that's the main sort of that's the main seed of how it how it should start off. And I think if they're, like I said, you're, you're going to make mistakes, but if they can see you're trying to do the right thing, and I think as long as they're sort of, I mean, they're, they're defending you and backing you up and you're, you're providing the, the response and doing what they're asking you to do, I think that's the sort of best thing for it. Yeah, I would agree. And as you mentioned, you can make mistakes, but if they see you're trying, if they see you're trying to progress and if they come out and back you, it's easy to kind of move on from that and begin to make things right and to progress properly. And that also would really help your mindset and your mentality. And that brings us on to the next topic, the match fit mindset. So tell me about the importance of being, you know, not only disciplined and 
and dedicated, but having a strong mindset, being able to overcome hardships and obstacles that come your way. Yeah, obviously, I think um, I think a lot of people agree. Is I think being a goalkeeper probably is mentally the hardest position on the pitch. You've got a lot of weight on your shoulders. It's one of the ones where if a striker makes a mistake, he's got seven, eight other players behind him to sort of try and defend him and help him out. If you as a goalkeeper, if you make a mistake, nine times out of ten, you're looking like a bit of an idiot and picking the ball out of the back of your net. So I think a lot of it, a lot of it is mentally pressure, pressuring for a goalkeeper. Um, but you've got to be strong minded as a goalkeeper because you've got to, you've got to realise you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes in front of 10, 15, 100,000, 10,000 people some days. So it's a case of being disciplined enough where relaxing, and enjoying the football, but just trying to do the right thing and knowing it's just, it's just working hard to make sure you don't keep making the same mistakes or make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes at some point, but it's just you're doing everything you can do to keep the mistakes to a, an absolute minimal. Is that hard in the sense, you know, you mentioned relax and enjoy your football, but obviously you're being switched on you're not, and you're making sure you don't make mistakes. Is that hard to find that balance between being relaxed and enjoyment and then maybe sometimes being wind up too tight, if I can word it that way, where you're maybe too serious that you're trying too hard? Yeah, definitely. You've, you've definitely got to find that balance because obviously if you're, not in, if you're not enjoying it, you're not going to probably put as much effort into doing it. And obviously if you don't put the effort into doing it, that's when you're more likely to make make mistakes for the team obviously you've got members not just you you're affecting your teammates and the gaffer and the fans and stuff as well so it's definitely trying to find that balance um but obviously I think luckily for me I do feel I am quite strong-minded there are times where I do feel pressure but I find sometimes I, I probably play and train better when I'm under that pressure because there's you can't put your foot off the pedal then you've got to make sure you're staying switched on and stuff like that as well so yeah, you said you put, you think you play better under pressure. Do you enjoy that pressure? Do you enjoy the weight of expectation? I, I do sometimes. I think it's one. I think it's more after the game's finished. Once you know that you've you've done what you need to do, it's it's just more. It's a bit of a relief, and you like then know right. I can deal with that as well. So um, so yeah, I'd probably say I do. I do enjoy the pressure. Obviously, sometimes you do feel nervous and stuff, but I think if you were to go into games and not feel nervous, sometimes it'd probably be a bit weird. And I feel like you're then more like take your foot off the gas if you're not feeling a little bit nervous sometimes or or feel like the pressure's on you a little bit. I think it's only human, isn't it? You know, to feel to feel that to feel nerves and to feel that excitement and maybe trepidation sometimes when you're the big away game or even the big home game. You know, you mentioned Selhurst Park and one of the probably the best or one of the best atmospheres in the Premier League. You know, it's loud, fans yeah, are close yeah. to the pitch, all that sort of stuff. And it's so key and vital to have that mindset, that strength. Uh, what I want to ask you about now is the biggest challenge in your career. What was the biggest challenge that you faced so far in your career and how did you overcome that challenge? Um, I've, I've probably had a, I've probably had a couple too. Far. I think the, the the first major one was uh, an injury I got at Crystal Palace. I was in training and I I broke my shoulder, uh, tore a ligament, tore a tendon, and tore a muscle, all, sort of all at the same time. And um, the physio said I'd be out for three to four months. Um, and I done the three four months, went back into training again, and did the same thing again. So I was out for another three to four months after that. So I felt like I'd wasted eight months of, of the year being out injured. And I think after that, things then at Palace started to change. Um, and I think at that time then I was thinking, am I going to get back to that level again? Or is this going to hinder me for going forward? So I think that was a definitely a big, a big uh, halt sort of in my career. I think that was a big problem in my career. But luckily, obviously... I've come out the other side of it. And I think the other big challenge was having the last year and a half, two years out of football to then try and stay focused enough to, to know and believe in myself that I can get back involved in football again. I think that's been another big challenge. And to be fair, it's, it, that's obviously the Crawley thing came up as unexpected and probably a bit sooner than I expected an opportunity to come up. But obviously when it's there, it's about making sure I'm ready enough and taking it. So I've been given the opportunity. So I've got a yeah, make sure I take it. Absolutely. And and so far you seem to be doing, you know, you seem to be enjoying your football. Um, yeah. I, you mentioned earlier, you know, you had that opportunity. You were talking to an agent about a, a move to Sweden. You're obviously open to, to playing abroad and to moving abroad to play football. Was that something that was always in your head that you'd like to try 
and play across the water yeah, somewhere. Yeah. I've had, yeah, I've had family and friends all, all ask me, oh, if you have the opportunity abroad, would you go? And I've always said, yeah, because do you know I, mean? I just love my football in general. And I've then the, the experience to say, oh, yeah, I've, I've played here for a couple of years or I've been out to here, been here. I've got I've got friends who play abroad at the moment and they all tell me they love it and stuff like that as well. And obviously when I signed at Peterborough, I moved, moved away from home from, from 14, 15. So I've been away from home for the last sort of, the last 10 years. So being away, I'm kind of, kind of used to it I'm kind of quite independent with a lot of things as well so yeah moving abroad or moving far away doesn't really doesn't really phase him too much and there's certainly a lot of opportunity abroad as well you know we've seen what Graham Potter was doing and um, when he was abroad and he's came back and that experience has obviously really helped him and I know there's a couple of English players that were out there playing with him at the time and they really were able to make a name for themselves playing in the Europa League and things like that so there's a, a lot of good opportunity there which is great to see um what do you think has given you an edge, you know, over maybe potentially other players or other goalkeepers that you've been vying for position with um, throughout your career? What has made you maybe, what has given you the edge that to push you, to, you know, to the elite level that maybe someone else hasn't had or doesn't want to commit to? Uh, I think it's probably that hunger when there's competition around. I feel like it's obviously even for me before when you've not had competition around you and you're sort of the only keeper there, whatever, it's easy to sort of be like, oh, it don't matter if I have a bad game here and there because there's no one going to challenge me. But I think it was a time when I was at, uh, when I was at Peterborough, about 16, 17, they actually brought another keeper in from uh, from Europe. And in my head then I sort of thought, oh, okay, I'm, I'm now not the only keeper here. And I know that they brought him in with intentions to play. And then... They brought him in, put him straight into the, the under 23s reserve team. And obviously I was then dropped out. And it was a case of there then thinking, well, now I've got to prove to them why I should be playing and not him. And I think him coming in spurred me on even more. And then a few weeks later, I'll find out where I'm then back in the team and I then managed to keep my place in the team. So I think when I've, when I've got competition around me, I think that's when it's best, best suited. Something you you've saw, been... as much as you're a GK union, you, you're pushing each other and you're helping each other. But at the same time, if you've got someone there pushing you, it pushes you on to to be better as well. Yeah, absolutely. And something you mentioned there was hunger, and you mentioned you know the hunger to improve and even hungry to play. And something which I think is really cool is a lot of people don't really like the competition. You know, they want to be first choice. They want to know they're playing every week. But you seem to have, from what you've told me there, you seem to thrive on that competition to push you to your limits to be better. Um, that's an attribute I think that not everyone has and it's something I think to be commended and something that I think is great because it's probably the hardest position in, in football is goalkeeper because you know your right back might get it you know a goalkeeper generally you have a number one keeper who plays every week you know it's very very hard to rotate whereas you know if an outfield player you're going to get 15 20 25 games a season through injury suspensions etc as a goalkeeper, that mindset just has to be bulletproof, I think. Yeah, I think obviously as a keeper, if you know you're not going to be playing or you're not going to be first choice, you know that so you've got to make sure you're as ready as you can be. So when that opportunity does come, you're ready for it. It's a case of where even if you're at a team where you know the number one plays every single game, you never know what's going to happen with injuries, with suspensions, with just a general loss of form. And if you're if you're constantly working hard behind the scenes and you're constantly making sure you're doing the right thing, if you are ever called upon, at least you're there ready. And you'd be surprised where a lot of people and a lot of coaches, they do see you working hard behind the scenes. And as, may, as much as they may not tell you, they do notice you're doing it. And it's one of the ones where they feel like, oh, if the keeper's struggling or he's played a lot of games, he's a bit tired or whatever else, they can then look at you and go, oh, why don't we give him a chance? He's been working hard. He seems, I mean, he seems up for it. So I think if, if you're, if you've got that mindset and that competition to thrive, I think it's when the opportunity does come and it will come at some point, it's just a case of when it comes, you just got to make sure you're as ready as you can be. And then when you do get put in, it's then keeping the, trying to do your best to prove why you should keep the shirt and keep playing absolutely and another thing that i want to ask you about as a goalkeeper is your relationship with your back four specifically your center backs mainly how important is that relationship and that bond between you guys or more so as a unit because i think a lot of people see the defense as a unit and then the keeper as a single standalone individual but i've always viewed football as 
defender and keeper is grouped together because there has to be an understanding and a, a communication there between the defence and the keeper throughout the whole game. Yeah, 100%. Obviously, with what it's like when it comes to clean sheets, it's not just the keeper that, that's there for. It's the defence and the keeper. You're all in charge of making sure you keep the, keep the team a clean sheet. And um, before every game, I'll, I'll have a chat with, with the back four who I'm playing with making sure we're on the same page, telling them the things that I'll be that I'll do. They're telling me the things they'll do. And it sort of makes sure you're on the same page and the same wavelength. So I know if I'm to them to stay high, they know that I'm then keeping a high line. So if the ball goes over their heads, I can then give them an early shout to let the ball come through to me. Or I can then talk to them, obviously, because they, they can't face me. They've got their backs to me. It's all a case of making sure my communication to them is as clear as it can be. So we're all on the same wavelength and we all can all play the same way. If I've always found this this portion of like football really, really interesting. If you're a man down and potentially have a lead or you may be playing against a team higher in the league who are favourites for the game and you're leading a game, and as the game progresses, your defence is getting deeper and narrower and you're trying to see out the game. How influential is the goalkeeper in that or is that just a natural progression of a team maybe to protect that lead? Um, obviously... I think it is a natural progression, but obviously I think it does more come from the defenders and the goalkeeper because a clean sheet is more our thing, do you know what I mean, than it, than it is for the midfielders or the, or the strikers sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll say if you're under the cosh and you're against a team that's that's all over you and there's sort of five minutes left and you're, I don't know, drawing the game and you're trying to see out the point or you're winning the game and trying to see out the three points, it's a case of just making sure you're all switched on. You're not sort of getting onto each other, but you're all sort of, telling each other to make sure you're all switched on, make sure we're on the same wavelength, making sure we trust each other. Because I know that at some point in in the game or in any other game where they're going to make a mistake and I'm going to have to be there to help them out. And then sometimes I'm going to make a mistake where I'm going to need them to help me out. So I think it's just a case of, like, like I said, making sure you're on the same wavelength, making sure you're all determined as hungry as each other to, to keep a clean sheet. Some days, obviously, some games it works, some days it doesn't, but to have a chance of it working, you've got to make sure you're you're always doing it. That's the thing with football, isn't it? And that's why it's you no know, the beautiful game, the crazy game, where some days it works, some days it doesn't work, some days it's yeah. kamikaze pinball football, and the next day it's a one nil. Um, you see it out and it's perfect, and you go home and and it's just it's just the beauty of football, I suppose. Um, Dion, this has been a really good conversation, bringing it to a to a close now. But before we do that, um, I want to know if you could give one piece of advice to a young footballer, maybe a teenager who is on their way to becoming a professional, or maybe some 11, 12 year old who wants to become a professional goalkeeper. What advice would you give them as they begin or continue along their journey? Um, obviously, I, I, like I said at the start, I think it is quite cliche, but I think it is just work your socks off. Like I said, a lot of players out there who maybe talent-wise, they're not great or they're not brilliant, but they've had careers through just working hard and um, being determined and the hunger and stuff. I think that's the main thing. I think that's if I was, and also like also doing your own research and also listening to listening to people who have been around the game longer than you. Because if you can listen to what people advice is and what they tell you, and then you can go home and do your own research on things, that's going to give you the best platform to go forward to make sure you're doing all the right things from nutrition to recovery to gym work, any help with your mental state and things like that as well. I think listening, listening to people who've got the experience and doing your own research and then just working hard because like I said, I've, I was doing it for seven, eight years and then, obviously got taken away from me with, with COVID and stuff and then having to go out and work like you'd, you'd say a normal job sort of thing. Um, you do then realise how important football is to you and how much of a, a privilege it is to get paid to play football, to do something you love doing. So yeah, like I said, I think just working hard and then just listening to people with that experience, doing your own research to give yourself the best opportunity. Cause at the end of the day, there is no, better job out there than getting paid to play football and do something that you love doing. I think you're 100% correct. You are the envy of quite a lot of people who get, who <laughs> want to play football and get paid to play football. And I do have, I do have another question. It's a bit more on the philosophy of, of football. And I hadn't really planned to ask this, but as football has progressed and evolved in the last 10, 15 years or so, there's been a lot more emphasis on playing out from the back and goalkeepers playing with their feet. 
from whenever you started out at 14 years old at Peterborough and moving all the way through to where you are now, is that something you've noticed has become more and more integral to the game? Yeah, is- yeah definitely. Obviously, when a club like Peterborough, when I, when I did sign there, um, Peterborough have always been a club that actually do try and play a bit of football anyway. So, obviously, I went to an academy where we was playing football. Obviously, when being quite a big lump, being quick, quite quick your feet is quite tough sometimes. So, it took a while to get going. But, like I said, when I was at Peterborough, it was quick football. And then when I signed the Palace with Frank De Boer there, a lot, of, again, was quick football, playing out with your feet. And I think just it's one of them ones where it comes in training, little things like, when the when in the warm ups when players are doing rondos and stuff like that, we'll get in a circle and sort of like two players in the middle and you're just sort of keeping the ball around. If you get a keeper involved in that as well, it's just there's so many drills and stuff like that to do where you can get your feet moving quick. And a lot of it is just practicing and training. And then like I said, when it comes to a game, it's just practice do what you do in training into a game situation and give yourself the best opportunity to um do it right in a game. That's fascinating. Fascinating insight. You know, it's something I've I've noticed and I've never really thought about it until to ask even a goalkeeper about that evolution of how football's changed until literally there now. So yeah, really... it, it does it does vary. Obviously, clubs you go out, some clubs have a philosophy of playing, some clubs don't. It's, it all depends who's in charge mm-hmm. and what the club's philosophy is, really. Like obviously at Crawley, there's a lot of clubs, uh, especially Crawley, like I said it's not so much play out from the back if it's blatantly on, if it's blatantly on to play and there's no pressure. But if not, it's a case of getting up the pitch and then a lot of clubs will will play their football in the other team's half and in the final third, that's where you play your football sort of thing like that as well. So you're taking obviously less risk out of the game. But obviously when you get to high levels like Premier League, you have got some teams, some players where they are good enough and have the quality enough to be able to play wherever they want on the pitch sort of thing. So... Yeah, absolutely. You know, you look at a keeper like Ederson, for example, who, you know, you, you think you could just stick an outfield top on him and put him in midfield. Exactly. You think he would still ping a few balls around, you know, <laughs> uh, just one of those one of those crazy, unique players. But Dion, this has been a really good conversation. I'm glad you were able to join me today on the Match Fit Football podcast. Um, where can people connect with you on social media if they want to continue to follow your journey? Um, I know you're on Instagram, are you on Twitter, anywhere else? Yeah, in- yeah Instagram and Twitter are probably the two main platforms I use. So, yeah. Well, guys, I encourage all of our listeners, give Dion a follow on Instagram, Twitter, and continue to follow his journey and see where he ends up. I would like to see you abroad at some stage. Of course, I want Crawley to work out for you, but I think (laughs) playing abroad would be quite fun for you as well. So thank you so much for your time. And obviously, you said you're going to Rochdale this weekend, so good luck with that. Good luck um, with the rest of the season, and and thank you for your time today. No, I appreciate it. Cheers for having me on the show. It's been uh, been enjoyable. Good, Good chat, so all good. Well, listeners, there you have it, Match Fit Football Podcast. This was this was Dion Henry. He's playing for Crawley Town. Look out for him on social media. Thank you for listening to us here at the Match Fit Football Podcast. And remember, at Match Fit Football on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram for all your Match Fit needs. And I've been Darren Potts. I'm going to be back next week. <laughs>